Okay, um, I'm Dwayne Holly. I'm also uh, part of Dr. Martin's um, uh, Water Force and Global Change class, and I will present to, uh, presenting today uh, the effects of climate change on waterfowl. Since the 1700s, um, the United States has experienced a lot of loss um, of wetlands due to climate change. However, um, most of that loss um, was not it, it was not evenly spread throughout the U.S., but it was more prominent in the southeastern regions of the U.S. Well, oh, oh. okay, there we go. Uh, climate change influences. Um, wildlife and waterfowl in several different ways. Uh, with climate change, it brings the warmer and drier air temperatures that decrease habitat uh, for waterfowl by drying up the, the wetlands and causing habitat fragmentation, uh, probably due to exurbanization. Exurbanization is the expansion of Residents moving from urban areas to more rural areas. And with that uh, causes more habitat degradation, habitat problems. Um, sorry. And a, a, a decrease overall in habitat quality. With that, um, brings uh, several more uh, environmental issues as well. Uh, it also leads to um, stream quality um, and water issues as well. Here, uh, just a more of, a, more of an example of exurbanization. Uh, the image on the top left uh, was taken in 2006 um, here in uh, my local community. And then the, the one on the bottom right um, was from 2021. And these, even the, uh, the, the current picture there now um, is experienced much more loss uh, between 95 there and that whole forested area between there and the neighborhood is, is now completely gone. Uh, they're still, they're, they're, they've cleared that out and they're, they've built more, more housing and resi residential zones between 95 and the, the current neighborhoods that are there now. So it's, it's happening at a fast rate. Um, as you can see, the fragmentation occurs along the edge of forest. Um, and what that does, it creates more edge. And with more edge you, you have, you're going to have a decline in in species. So in conclusion, um, as wildlife managers, some things we can do is when we start preparing, uh, start preparing management plans, is you start incorporating climate change into those management plans, uh, keep those management plans flexible, um, treat them as a living, breathing document, and continue to project forward and decrease for and decrease um, exurbanization. And that concludes my brief. Thank you. Sounds great. Our next presenter will be Kristen Cash. Sorry, hold on. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Kirsten Cash. I'm also part of Dr. Martin's class, um, and I will be talking about disturbances on native North Carolina aquatic species due to climate change. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's frozen. <laughs> Sorry. I just... Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So there are plenty of native North Carolina species that are affected by climate change, but today I am going to be talking about the bull shark and the loggerhead sea turtle. Um, so what we will see with this is potential for loss of biodiversity, and that is really important to all ecosystems. So due to this loss of biodiversity, we are looking at complete ecosystem collapse off of the coast of North Carolina. Um, so I'm first going to be talking about bull sharks. Um, so they're most affected by rising um, sea temperature increases, and this is actually shifting their range or habitat more northward. Um, so due to this, that means that in North Carolina, we are starting to see an increase in oversaturation of bull sharks in the sound and estuaries. They're mainly using this area as their own nurseries. Um, so just due to that, we're not only seeing adult, but we're also seeing a lot of juveniles um, kind of using this as their more permanent range, let alone nurseries. Um, and there's actually a quote that I found really useful in explaining this, but shifts in biodiversity can result in significant changes to local food web dynamics, ecosystem productivity, and even fisheries. These ecological effects may even be more pronounced if a species is new to a region and is an apex predator like a shark. So what we're seeing here. Um, and this figure is just showing um, bull shark catches that they have found or that they have caught recently off of the coast of North Carolina. Okay, um, so for loggerhead sea turtles, they are also affected by increase in sea temperature, but in a different way. Um, so their sex ratio is actually um, determined by the heat that they their eggs are incubated in. Um, so in this graphic, you can tell that um, females are more likely to be produced in warmer environments and males in like cooler temperatures. Um, so as temperatures increase, we're starting to see a shift towards more female sex ratios or females, uh, loggerhead sea turtles. Um, so in 2007, um, some scientists did a study off of or in and around Baldhead Island, Island, North Carolina. Um, and found that it was, the sex ratio was relatively normal, 58% female. Um, but according to a study done more recently in 2018, um, they actually found a shift towards 81% female. And they only predict this increasing till about 100% female. Obviously, we're looking at population loss for the loggerhead sea turtle, loss of biodiversity, and um, a big impact on that ecosystem. Um, this is just another graphic showing um, the amount of loggerhead sea turtles and whether they're male, male or female, excuse me. Um, okay, so what this means, um, these species that I've just talked about, they are all keystone species for their environment. This means that they play very integral and integral and important roles to that ecosystem. So if they face any big changes or loss of population that can have a whole negative impact on the ecosystem. Um, loss of biodiversity would cause a myriad of problems um, surrounding any ecosystem, let alone North Carolina's. Um, so rising sea level, uh, rising sea temperatures are the biggest role and impact of climate change on these species, because um, the ocean is um, the first to be affected by rising temperatures in the atmosphere. Um, as we know, biodiversity can be critically important for any ecosystem function, but what we're looking at here with this loss of biodiversity is complete ecosystem collapse. Um, so to avoid this and any costly damages that will affect both humans and animals alike off the, or in and around North Carolina, um, it is important that people and also the government alike um, needs to be more proactive in addressing and mitigating climate change in total. All right, thank you so much. All right, hi everybody. My name is Margaret Haney. I'm a junior in environmental science here at NC State and I'm a part of Dr. Martin's ES 495 class. Today I'm going to be talking about North Carolina's climate change induced coastal wetland migration. So we're going to start by looking at a current summary of North Carolina's wet wetland distribution. North Carolina is home to approximately 5.7 million acres of wetland. 
that makes up 17% of the entire state. About 95% of our wetlands are located on the eastern portion of North Carolina, as you can see in this map. So that means that the majority of our wetland habitat is extremely at risk of flooding and um, saltwater intrusion. And unfortunately, no matter what the RCP scenario is that we're looking at, we are going to be seeing at least some degree of sea level rise um, in our near future. So estimates show that there could be anywhere from one foot to over eight feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. And as you can see in this map, um, even uh, increases of three feet and four and a half feet will um, create drastic changes to our coastline. This is a huge threat to coastal wetlands because these ecosystems are not adapted to really high levels of salinity. So as more and more salt water enters these ecosystems, they'll slowly start to transition from really productive wetlands into open ocean. Uh, scientists say that we can lose anywhere from 40 to 60% of our coastal wetlands by the year 2100. This has a direct impact onto us as humans because we rely on coastal wetlands for a lot of really important ecosystem services. So for example, um, coastal wetlands are huge sinks for carbon and nitrogen. As these ecosystems slowly start transitioning into um, open ocean, all of this carbon and nitrogen is going to be lost into the atmosphere. And because these are really um, harmful greenhouse gases, it will only further perpetuate the climate change that we're experiencing today. In addition, um, coastal wetlands provide a very unique and important habitat to a lot of important species. For example, about 70% of North Carolina's rare or endangered species depend on coastal wetlands for either habitat or migration purposes. And about 90% of our commercial fish harvest is estuary dependent. So not only um, will the loss of wetland lead to the loss of biodiversity, but also it will mean a lot of really big economic losses for our state. Finally, North Carolina um, really depends on coastal wetlands as um, uh, buffer zones for things like hurricanes and storm surges off of our coast. As these natural phenomena are um, increasing in severity and intensity with climate change, if we're losing a lot of this really protective habitat barrier, it will only increase the risks for the 1.2 million people along North Carolina's coast um, and all of the important infrastructure and development we have. So this is where the idea of wetland migration can kind of come into play. So as our sea level is rising, the changes in environmental conditions alongside our new coastline will begin to resemble the environmental conditions under which wetlands are able to thrive right now. So that means that we can see um, the creation of new wetlands further inland and also the movement of current wetlands uh, further inland as well. So this is a little graphic that kind of depicts this idea. So we have our present day coastlines on the right, the two little green boxes are our wetlands. And then the two sections on the left show what will happen after sea level rise occurs. So in the middle, this is what will happen if we don't allow coastal um, wetland migration to happen. We're gonna lose a lot of this really important habitat. But if we do allow coastal migration to happen, the wetlands will um, travel alongside the coastline and we can continue to benefit from all of these really important ecosystem services um, that I mentioned earlier. So how are we going to be able to do this along a coastline that's as developed as North Carolina's? So this is a study that was conducted along the Gulf of Mexico. The researchers found that the opportunity or areas that have a high opportunity for wetland migration also tend to have really high urban barriers to wetland migration. So as a solution, these scientists suggested um, utilizing migration corridors in our future landscape conservation planning. So this will allow us to kind of guide the movement of coastal wetlands further inland so that we can avoid all of these highly developed and highly populated areas. This has a lot of opportunity for further research and implementation in North Carolina as we begin to prepare for our changing coastline. And um, though unfortunately, you know, it won't allow us to completely ignore the, the issue of sea level rise for our coastal communities, it can buy us some time to figure out other mitigation strategies while continuing to encourage the um, health and safety of our wetland habitats that we depend on um, so many, uh, we depend on for so many important ecosystem services. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Here are my references. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is here, Olivia Gregg. Hi everyone, my name is Olivia Gregg. Um, I'm a senior in environmental sciences with the College of Natural Resources at NC State. And today I'll be talking to you a little bit about ghost forests. So ghost forests are groups of trees that are dead or dying as a result of a disturbance 
which in this case is saltwater exposure. And that's due to three major factors. We're seeing flooding and storm surges, which um, for obvious reasons, they bring in saltwater and also cause other damages. Droughts, which may seem like an unlikely factor, but actually it causes inland water sources that are brackish, which are not fully salt, um, to become more concentrated, which exposes the um, plants and tree, uh, obviously trees or plants, um, the ecosystem to higher levels of salinity. And then saltwater intrusion, which is kind of the slow creeping in um, due to sea level rise. So our coastal forests are a um, huge carbon sink, which means they hold a lot of carbon. Um, and that's carbon that's not in the atmosphere, which is awesome. Um, the sad thing about the um, these forests is that they also have a high risk of damage due to their proximity to the ocean and those three factors that I just discussed. Uh, so a forest transitioning into a ghost forest happens in three major stages. And at first it kind of happens slowly. The ecosystem is exposed to salt water and it experiences reduced sap flow um, or in trees, the trees experience reduced sap flow and they also experience stunted growth. Um, and it happens pretty slowly, like I said, until a tipping point is reached, which basically means that the ecosystem can no longer recover from the exposure to the salt water. And that's when stage two begins. In stage two, younger trees begin to die off and small saplings can no longer establish themselves. So our population becomes entirely made up of mature trees. There's no new tree growth. And in stage three, older trees are dead or dying and salt tolerant species begin to take up residence as the uh, tree canopy begins to open up because they no longer have foliage and they're kind of just um, standing trunks at that point. So this graphic here um, shows the three different stages. You can see um, stage one pertains to A, um, B is two and C is the third. You can see the progression in our first stage. You can see that the small tree is experiencing some death of the foliage. Um, and then you can see the saltwater tolerant species creeping in in part B. And then in part C, you can see that it's pretty much turned into entirely marsh with um, our just kind of stags without foliage. This is an aerial time lapse of a ghost forest on the Alligator River. Um, which is on the Albemarle Pamlico Sound um, on the east coast of North Carolina. Let's see if it'll cook. Yeah, awesome. So you can see right here, this area, um, it starts off as kind of green and then it gets more and more brown. And if I were to zoom in, actually you'd be able to see what looks like matchsticks. But in reality, um, that area is actually covered by dead trees. It's a ghost forest. <laughs> I can't see for, because of the bar. Okay, great, thank you. Awesome. Uh, so overall, eustatic sea level rise is predicted to reach 0.4 to 1.2 meters of rise by 2100, and that's due to glacial melt and ocean water expansion. Um, the East Coast is showing the most prevalent land loss, so North Carolina is at a very high risk, and we're also at risk for more extreme weather events, which cause um, storm surges, flooding, and also higher temperatures, so that means more droughts. <clears throat> and essentially, um, one of the big ideas is that the death of these coastal forests, like we talked about, um, would cause carbon to be released into the atmosphere. And um, there are people that study this using the eddy covariance system that measures carbon flux is in the atmosphere surrounding these dying forests. So the three main takeaways. Uh, ghost forests are a result of damage to the tree tissues from exposure to salt water. And as we said before, healthy forests are carbon sinks and these dying forests are carbon sources. Um, and then these disturbances, we're expecting them to increase because obviously our climate is continuing to change and that's going to cause more intense weather and droughts and um, pretty much an increase in all three of the factors that we just talked about, which means that our coastal forests face a very uncertain future. These are my sources, thank you. Good job, Olivia. Sarah? 
Hi, should I share my screen now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Kara Franticini, an undergraduate student at North Carolina State University. My presentation will be about how climate change and water quality affect Cryptobranchus alleganesis, when more commonly known as the Eastern Hell Thunder. And before we get started, can everybody see my slides and hear me? Can everybody see? Hello? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So the Eastern Hell Thunder Salamander lives in rocky streams and rivers in the Eastern US. They need cool running water and we'll get more into that later. They are amphibians. They have a flat body that clings to the river bottom in order to shelter themselves. And they have skin folds to increase oxygen absorption with their surface area. And we'll get more into that later as well. They're listed as near threatened on the IUCN red list with populations decreasing. Since we're all proficient with environmental topics here, I, I won't give any background on climate change. With this being said, climate change is very harmful for aquatic amphibians. The hellbender is, is specifically vulnerable to them breathing through their skin. <clears throat> their habitat needs to be clean, cool running water in order to fit their special cutaneous respiratory system. As temperatures warm, the dissolved oxygen decreases, which is harmful to their respiration. We tend to focus more on high temperatures due to climate change, but extreme cold temperatures are also detrimental to the hellbender's health and growth. Also, with warmer temperatures, disease spreads more quickly due to it being more suitable for most vectors. This is an upcoming cause of amphibian population decline. The picture to the right is an example of disease rising in Easter hellbenders, the chytrid fungus. It is deadly and breeds more in warmer climates. The larvae and adults need a coarse rocky stream bed to avoid predation and provide shelter as seen in the bottom right picture. Although it seems to be a recurring theme at this point, Hellbenders need sufficient dissolved oxygen concentrations in order to fill their need to constantly respire. Lastly, hellbenders need streams that connect to one another so they have an adequate immigrant and emigrant traffic to mix up gene pool and avoid extinction. If you look at the figure on the bottom left, you can see that streams have the most connectivities, which allows for species to interact if there is no buffer. One of the most harmful factors in stream water is siltation. This increases the buildup of unwanted sediments on the stream bed, which takes away space from the hellbender to hide themselves and their eggs. Some main reasons for siltation would be road construction, urbanization, farming, harvesting of forest goods, and more. Next, dams cut off connectivity between streams, which reduces the gene pool for the hellbender, which could lead to their demise due to lack of genetic variation. Human recre recreation could also be a negative impact and impede on hellbenders, but that's kind of self-explanatory at this point, so I won't get too far into that. Farming is a huge harm to stream water quality. It uses pesticides with detrimental chemicals that will eventually be absorbed into the hellbender via their skin. In addition, farming uses fertilizers, which can increase siltation, but more importantly, provide excess nutrients. This causes algal blooms, which clog the streams and uses up oxygen and creates a dead zone. The Eastern Hellbender is found mainly in mountain, mountain counties in Western North Carolina, as seen in the map on the slide. These streams are drainages from the Ohio and Tennessee rivers. The North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission listed them as special concern, which means it is illegal to hunt, kill, harm, or sell them. Even though North Carolina National Forests protect the watersheds where they live, hellbenders are still decreasing in North Carolina due to development and land usage. Now here's just a conclusion slide. You may be asking, why should we care? Well, it is still unknown as to why hellbenders are increasing so much or decreasing so much, and we currently don't have enough answers to help them. 
Also, there are indicator species that let us know the health of our streams and rivers. What are some of the ways you could help the Eastern Hellbender? Well, you could handle them with care if you come in contact with one, email the email listed for observations, or help to research these precious animals through the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. So thank you. I don't think we have time for questions, but thank you for your attention. And then here are my sources. Great, thank you, Kara. Yeah, yeah. thank you guys. Our next speaker is coming to us virtually. It's Emily Oven. Hi everyone, I'm Emily and I'm a master's student at NC State. I'll be talking to you about investigating the effects of disease and urbanization on snakes in the Neuse River watershed here in North Carolina. I'm particularly interested in the upper part of the Neuse River watershed that includes Raleigh and Durham. This watershed is home to about one sixth of the state's population, particularly around the cities of Durham and Raleigh. And as we all know, the Triangle is one of the fastest growing regions in the country, making this area of the watershed particularly interesting because of increasing urbanization as well as development, which can lead to decreases in available habitat for wildlife that depend on the resources of this ecosystem. In recent decades, the news has been highlighted in toxicology reports as having high levels of municipal and agricultural pollution, which are concerning for both people and wildlife. These pollutants undoubtedly affect water quality and change resource availability. But what I want to highlight the most is that the News River is home to a unique diversity of amphibians and reptiles. My master's research focuses on local snakes, so I've highlighted a couple snake species that call this watershed home, such as the northern water snake, the worm snake, the red-bellied snake, and the eastern garter snake, just to name a few. Snakes are interesting to study because there are so many different species in this watershed, and they are often cryptic and hidden away, so they're not always the first species one thinks to study. However, snakes are important ecologically, acting as prey for larger predators, and as predators themselves helping to control prey populations. But as mentioned above, they are cryptic and hard to study using traditional ecological methods. So what are some other study methods we can use? I have a background in parasite ecology. And when it comes to studying cryptic species, I think about using parasites or disease to better understand host ecology. We are able to use parasites to study host ecology because most parasites have complex life cycles as pictured in this slide. And those complex life cycles can be used to make inferences about a host. For example, we can learn more about host diets, habitat use, food web complexity, health, and so on. Likewise, some parasites can be used to gain insight on environmental quality or as bioindicators of ecosystem health. And when we pivot to the more urban areas of the New River watershed, we can apply what we already know, which is that urbanization affects biodiversity through different mechanisms such as resource competition, altered trophic interactions, and disease. And highlighting the disease portion of that statement, we know that urbanization can amplify or limit pathogen transmission depending on factors such as habitat connectivity, diet composition, habitat specialization of the host, and so on. I want to highlight that there are many different mechanisms of disease we can investigate as researchers. And that this is particularly applicable to Raleigh and Durham because of the many greenways and parks we have that represent the interface between urban and natural areas. It's interesting to think about how urbanization affects pathogen and parasite transmission in wildlife throughout this particular watershed. And one group of parasites that are especially interesting to study in wildlife hosts in this human context are fungal parasites. Fungal diseases are on the rise. This is due to warming temperatures caused by climate change, urbanization, and increased global connectivity of humans. Some examples of well-known fungal diseases I'm sure some of you have heard of are white nose syndrome in bats, chytrid in amphibians, and aphidiomycosis or snake fungal disease in snakes. My master's research focuses on the fungal parasite that causes snake fungal disease and using that parasite to better understand snake ecology and health in this watershed. So let's review some of the things we've talked about and connect those ideas to snake fungal disease. So we learned that we can use parasites and pathogens to better understand snake ecology and health. So we can predict that snake fungal disease will be more prevalent and severe in urban environments where temperatures may be more favorable for the fungus and snake species may be less resistant or less tolerant due to density dependent effects and anthropogenic stressors that I mentioned earlier. Overall, this research can help us gain insights on which habitats to prioritize for snake conservation and which in interventions might best improve snake health in the urban parts of this watershed. 
So in conclusion, the Noose River is home to a high biodiversity of snakes that are being directly impacted by urbanization and climate change. So the next time you're walking or hiking around a local park or forest, I want you to look for amphibians and reptiles and think about the habitat and resources they depend on. Then I challenge you to connect those thoughts to how urbanization is impacting their health and ecology and come up with any possible solutions of your own. Thank you for your time. Rounding out our lightning talks, uh, Matilda Flaging is up next virtually. All right, my name is Matilda Flaging. I'm a major in environmental sciences at NC State, and I research sustainable aquaculture in North Carolina. Aquaculture can be defined as the cultivation of aquatic animals and plants, especially fish, shellfish, and seaweed, in natural or controlled marine or freshwater environments under water agriculture. Sustainability can be defined as avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. And sustainable aquaculture can be understood as an, an approach to the cultivation of aquatic species for food and commercial, commercial purposes, utilizing systems that do not pose harm to the environment and support the preservation of resources needed to meet human food demand. So some of the benefits include bivalve shellfish dem demonstrate promise as an in-water strategy to support land-based nutrient management. Fire extraction of nitrogen has been shown by oysters and multiple forms of shellfish uh, help in reducing some of the effects of eutrophication. Shellfish can also improve water quality through shellfish filter feeding and sustainable aquaculture can stimulate species diversity and abundance and help strengthen local economies. Why is sustainable aquaculture important? It's one of the fastest growing food production sectors in the world. It's developing and growing in regions around the world. Sustainable aquaculture has a reduced carbon footprint due to reduced greenhouse gas emissions and has market demand as it has production of safe and quality products, provides goods used by humans without detrimental harm to the environment, can help with food security. Global climate change and international seafood demand Aquaculture has a growth rate of 6% per year and help with current food demand as well as future food demand. The aquaculture sector has some challenges it needs to resolve to meet demand as an environmentally viable option. And oceans and waterways only use a total of 2% of global space for food production. Aquaculture sites do need to work on reducing pollution, although pollution from aquaculture sites is considerably less than ag agriculture. And ultimately, regulatory changes will need to be made to make this option more viable. Some of North Carolina's accomplishments include the North Carolina Oyster Blueprint, uh, re restoration of 450 acres of oyster habitat, and documentation of economic benefits of oyster restoration. North Carolina had a shell recycling program from 2003 to 2015, where they collected over 250,000 bushels of shells. Uh, Increasing funds for oyster-related programs, creating a North Carolina strategic plan for mariculture. Uh, North Carolina has grown the industry from 250,000 to 5 million and increased the number of oyster farms in the state. And the shellfish industry in North Carolina has been stable for over 30 years. Uh, looking forward, North Carolina has another oyster blueprint with the four initiatives of protect, restore, harvest, and educate. And during an evaluation of environmental impacts and ecosystem services of aquaculture in the North Carolina National Estuarian Research Reserve, it was determined that the total potential of nitrogen removal by oysters in the state of North Carolina has a value of three to $14 million. North Carolina also signed the NOAA's National Restoffice Initiative in 2018. And 
has a plan for the prevention of marine debris from shellfish mariculture, including best management practice practices. And North Carolina launched the first, it's the first state to launch a shellfish initiative in the Southeast and the sixth in the nation. My reference is here. Thank you so much. Awesome job. That rounds out our lightning session. Some of our speakers are still here in the room and some are still here virtually. Are there, can I moderate any questions from anyone? All right, we covered a wide range of topics. These are these topics were chosen by the students based on their interests. Um, so I hope you enjoy them and thank you for coming to our session. <laughs>